Hey guys and welcome back to By Holly G. It's been a very long time since I've said that and I am so sorry for not uploading on this channel for a long time but I really want to be consistent in 2023 and then going forwards I just want to share so much more biology with you guys on this channel because I just love what I've created here and I really want to, you know, keep going with it, obviously. Today's video is basically going to be all about like cervical cancer, cervical cancer screening and human papillomavirus or HPV because if you know me from my main channel and I did vlogmas this year, one of my episodes was all about like cervical cancer because I had my first smear test so i shared some biology in that video but i wanted to create like a full video on this channel if you missed that one or if you just want some more details obviously so yeah i really hope you guys enjoy this video and find it useful so definitely i like it if you do enjoy it and you learn something and if you have any video ideas obviously leave those down below i just really want to hopefully empower you guys especially females to you know know more about your health and to go and get a smear test when you are offered one because is at the end of the day they are so important and they have a very beneficial use so yeah if you want to as i said though see what it's like to get a smear test obviously i don't show you everything but like that is on my main channel i will leave that linked down below for you guys but yeah without me waffling too much we're gonna dive straight into this video and basically answer a series of questions to fully understand cervical cancer hpv and smear test screening so question number one is is cancer caused by infectious agents because obviously we are talking about cancer here and basically in short yes cancer can be caused by an infection approximately one in five cancers are basically caused by an infectious agent and that could be like a bacterium for example like helicobacter pylori um it could be a virus um a parasite for example we also know that 10 to 15 percent of cancers are caused by a total of seven viruses and these are what we call tumor viruses so that obviously includes like human papillomavirus which we're talking about today so hpv but also the first one to be discovered, which was Epstein-Barr virus, and that causes Burkitt's lymphoma. We've got hepatitis B and hepatitis C viruses, and then others within that seven. But with more research being done, we now know that there are other viruses, for example, like HIV, that are now associated with cancer. And these tumor viruses, they are kind of interesting because... In a tumor virus causing cancer it doesn't provide that virus with any kind of like selective advantage evolutionarily so they are kind of a bit strange and it's unknown as to why these viruses have evolved ways in which they cause cancer because as i said it doesn't like do them any good the next question then is what is hpv so human papillomavirus these viruses human papillomavirus they do cause infections but these infections are normally like transient or short-lived they're subclinical without many symptoms and they're just like normally cleared very easily by the immune system hpv causing cancer is quite like a rare occurrence obviously and there are loads of different types of hpv like honestly loads so we classify them into five genera so genera is the plural for genus and it's the alpha genus that i want to like focus on because we can split the alpha genus into high risk types we have low risk cutaneous and low risk mucosal so the thing with hpv is that they infect distinct anatomical sites within the body and another thing to say about hpv is that it's normally sexually transmitted so during like vaginal or anal sex however it can be transmitted through like skin to skin contact sort of thing and then with those high risk types so within the alpha genus they are known carcinogens so they are cancer causing agent that's basically what a carcinogen is and they are responsible for about five percent of cancers worldwide high risk hpv infection is the primary or the main risk factor for cervical cancer and almost every case of cervical cancer is associated with hpv infection now we have most commonly studied the high risk types 16 and 18 and these are responsible collectively for like about 70 percent of um, cervical cancers in europe but it is important to note that high risk HPV types, they do cause other forms of cancer. So like penile cancers, anogenital and head and neck cancers. But obviously the focus in this video again is like HPV infection and cervical cancer in women. So as we're talking about the cervix, I do just want to go over the cervical anatomy because 
I feel like this is important to know and I can like link down below my menstrual cycle video which also has this information in it but I'm gonna kind of address some different things here as well but essentially the cervix is the lower fibromuscular portion of the uterus so I'll point out the two openings of the cervix we have the internal and external OS but more importantly really we have what's called the ecto cervix and the endo cervix so the ecto cervix basically projects into the vagina and that is is composed of stratified squamous epithelium so it's multi-layered but then the endocervix by contrast is composed of a single layer of cells and those are columnar cells they're also glandular in that they secrete mucus and then the boundary between the ectocervix and the endocervix that's called the squamocolumnar junction which can often be quite distinct actually so that you can distinctly separate the stratified squamous multi-layered epithelium from the single layer of columnar cells one of the most interesting things i want to point out here is what we call the transformation zone so we have a squamer columnar junction that appears before puberty and then that kind of moves so we have a post puberty squamo columnar junction and the region between those two points that's called your transformation zone because essentially what happens is a process called metaplasia now the thing i want to emphasize here is that this is a normal process metaplasia is basically the change in one cell type to another and in this context we have like chronic irritation from the highly acidic vaginal environment and that causes the columnar cells to change into squamous epithelium and that means the squamo columnar junction moves and it moves kind of during puberty and it creates what we call the transformation zone so question number four then and this is halfway because we have eight questions in total but basically how does hpv or the high risk types cause cancer now as i said and going back to before most hpv infections are transient they are cleared by the immune system so they're not problematic and they don't cause cancer but when they do cause cancer, obviously things go wrong. And this basically happens when the viral infection is persistent. So the immune system cannot clear the virus. And as a result, they start to like overexpress these viral oncoproteins. So proteins that can cause cancer. And normally the expression of these proteins is tightly regulated. So this doesn't normally go wrong. But when the virus persists and these proteins, their expression is dysregulated, that can lead to cancerous changes and progression to cervical cancer. Now, the two that are relevant here are E6 and E7, these two oncoproteins. Now, I'm going to make another video that's all about the mechanism of how E6 and E7 cause cancer because it is very detailed and quite complex. But for now, I'm basically just going to say that E6... What it does is it causes degradation of a protein that we call p53 and as a result of that cells don't undergo cell death or apoptosis and if we have less cell death then it means that you are more likely to cause cancer because a cell that for example has mutations or damage is going to survive when it should really die and that can contribute to cancer sort of thing so in short e6 degrades p53 so it means that cells don't die by apoptosis and what e7 does when it's overexpressed it basically inactivates rb and as a result of that it causes dysregulated cell division which is another hallmark of cancer so a key property of cancer cells they divide abnormally out of control when they shouldn't do and so together e6 and e7 they can contribute to cervical cancer and they're overexpressed during viral persistence so when the virus and the infection isn't cleared normally but i should also say that in the high risk hpv types these oncoproteins also have acquired other functions which is quite interesting so like they can cause immune evasion for example which is again something that we're seeing in a lot of cancers like the immune system fails to destroy cancer cells when normally our immune system can recognize and get rid of potentially cancerous cells. The next question is basically where in particular does HPV normally cause cancer? So we know that HPV infection can occur within the ectocervix, the endocervix, and the transformation zone. But it's that transformation zone that's highly predisposed to cancerous or neoplastic transformation. And so the majority of cancers, like high-grade cervical cancers, they arise from that transformation zone. Like we rarely see high-grade cervical cancer arising from like the ectocervix in particular. Now, research is still being done to kind of work out why we think the transformation zone is 
particularly susceptible to cancerous transformation, but it might be something to do with cells within that region having like stem-like properties that are more likely to lead to these, what we call abortive infections, as opposed to productive infections. So a productive HPV infection would be like a normal one where it doesn't kind of lead to or promote cancerous changes within a cell. And an abortive infection is one where we have like the persistence and the expression of those oncoproteins. And perhaps it's like stem-like cells within the transformation zone that are more amenable to support those abortive infections. Maybe that could be a potential hypothesis, but as I said, there is still research that needs to be done to work out why we see a lot of cancers and aggressive cancers or high grade ones arising from within that transformation zone. The next question, question number six, is basically do the low risk HPV types cause cancer? Now the answer in short is yes, they can potentially cause cancer. However, they are a lot less commonly associated with cancer in contrast to the high risk types. And they are more so associated with like warts. So for example, like genital warts, which are benign, they're not malignant and like cancerous technically. The next question is a much bigger one to answer. So what is cervical screening basically? Now I had my first smear test this year, as I said to you guys. Now a screening program is a program designed to detect cancer early and to then hopefully do something about that. Because if you detect cancer at an earlier stage, it is much more likely that it is gonna be successfully treated. Now we do have something that's called the Wilson and Younger. I think that's how you say his name, um, the Wilson and Younger criteria. So before a screening program is implemented, it needs to satisfy this set of criteria in order for it to be, yes, like implemented and to be kind of successful. So obviously the cervical screening program, it has been hugely successful and studies have said and claimed that it's prevented a huge epidemic in women because it's prevented like an outbreak, we could say, of cervical cancer. And we know that with cervical screening, it's like a very safe procedure Procedure. It's well tolerated generally within society. It's very cost effective. It's sensitive and specific in detecting not only HPV DNA, but also abnormal cells. And so there are lots of reasons as to why this is a very good screening program and why it has been so hugely successful in women. Now I'm gonna talk about this in the context of the UK because I am obviously a resident of the UK, but basically it's called the PAP smear test and PAP is just derived from the name of the scientist who discovered it. Now this is conducted in women every like three years starting from the age of like 25 and it basically looks for two things. So the first thing it looks for is HPV DNA or basically HPV infection. And it does so using something that's called in situ hybridization. So it's looking for the HPV DNA and that's the technique that we use. And then following that, if you are HPV negative, so you don't have the infection, nothing else will be done. Because as I said before, pretty much every case of cervical cancer is associated with HPV infection. So if you're not infected, it doesn't make sense to look for cancerous cells. If you are positive for HPV, then they will go on to look for what's called cervical intraepithelial neoplasia. It's basically looking for abnormal cells. And the general term for abnormal cells in like histopathology is what we call dysplasia and a dysplastic cell is an abnormal cell. And with cervical cancer, we have these distinct stages of sin. So we have sin one, two, and three, that increase in severity or increase in abnormality. And we can look for those under the microscope to see if any of the cells are potentially cancerous. Now, the thing to emphasize here is that sin one, two, and three, they are abnormal cells and it's pre-malignant. Once you pass sin three, which is the most severe, that's when you get like invasive carcinoma so full-blown cancer the cells start to become invasive and they start to potentially migrate around the body in metastasis the process of cancer cell spreading and how we like separate sin one two and three it's based on the thickness of the layer of cells that are abnormal sort of thing and from sin one two and three we have an increasing thickness of cells that are dysplastic or abnormal and the way in which we'd like recognize abnormal cells for example would be by seeing if there's a very densely staining nucleus inside the cell that's very large. We have like what's called an increased nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio, for example. You would see more cells undergoing mitosis. So that's what we call mitotic figures. The nucleus would be an abnormal shape and size, but there are lots of signs that we can use. And histopathologists are basically trained to look for these changes. And if you have abnormal cells, so sin is detected, what normally happens is you just have quite a simple surgical procedure to remove those cells. And by clearing the 
infection and getting rid of those cells, you dramatically reduce the incidence and mortality associated with cervical cancer. Hence why the screening program is so effective because it's very, very good at detecting not only infection with HPV, but also these abnormal or dysplastic cells. The final question then relates to the HPV vaccination program. So what is this all about? So in the UK, again, we have a vaccination program. It's a prophylactic or a preventative vaccination program. So its aim is to prevent HPV infection and it's offered to girls aged between 12 and 13. So I remember having this vaccination in school actually and this one vaccine is called Gardasil. It's a tetravalent vaccine. It's not actually the one that I had but Gardasil is a tetravalent vaccine because it prevents against four types of HPV. So obviously types 16 and 18 which are the high risk alpha types but it also prevents um hpv type 6 and 11 as well so these are low risk types but the reason why they combine four in one is to protect against cancer like the high risk types and you can also reduce the incidence of genital warts at the same time which is also good now as i said this vaccine is offered to girls and there are obviously controversies and debates regarding whether this vaccination should be given to males as well because obviously hpv is sexually transmitted but obviously at the moment and in the uk it isn't and it's just offered to girls aged between 12 and 13 but it is a prophylactic as i said preventative vaccination so together the vaccination program and the cervical screening program together they are very effective in preventing HPV infection or like detecting it early, diagnosing abnormal cells early and doing something about it to significantly reduce the incidence of cervical cancer in women. So that's basically today's video all about, you know, like the infectious agent, the cancer and how we kind of like go about preventing it. Obviously, as I said at the start, if you have any questions or further video ideas, feel free to leave those down below. And if you want to stay tuned for more biology, you can definitely subscribe and hit the bell so you know when I upload. But that is it basically from me and I will speak to you guys very soon with more biology from Biology. Bye!